joining us. Uh, it's, we are, seem to be inching our way towards normalcy again, uh, perhaps, but nonetheless, I'm glad that you've, you've joined this way again this week. When Matt asked me to teach, uh, I immediately had something that I uh, was prepared to speak on. Uh, I'm actually, I've been going through Joshua again uh, recently, and every time I go through Joshua, there's always a verse that I kind of get hung up on, um, and probably not for the reason you think. Uh, it's, it's a popular verse that a lot of people know and use and quote and have uh, on little displays from Hobby Lobby and, and, and do DIY projects with, and um, it's a widely quoted verse, and every time I come through Joshua, I'm all, I always wind up pausing at this verse, um, somewhat for that reason. Um, we're going to kind of talk about that a little bit today. Uh, I would say the church at large, but I really think that, that there's an issue that, that expands well beyond just the church of, of um, misusing Scripture. Uh, and and the, the thing about uh, what we call taking things out of context is that it's not always malicious in intent. And we're going to talk about that a little bit, but it's not explicitly uh, the intentional twisting of Scripture um, to accomplish you know, evil goals, I don't think. Uh, but nonetheless, it's, it's inappropriate to use Scripture out of context and, and, and um, incorrectly. Uh, no matter the intention, and so, uh, to be honest with you, I think this is one of those verses uh, that often we misuse. Uh, you probably guess which verse I'm talking about, of course, verse 9. Uh, the context in which we read Scripture matters, and context runs a lot deeper than establishing who said something or what they said before it and right after it. That's certainly a good start, but we can think of examples in and we can realize that context is so much broader than just the verse before and the verse after. Uh, the example I gave, and this is kind of an obvious one, and this isn't to my credit, I've heard this used before. If you go to the 27th chapter of Matthew, um, you can find a verse that talks about uh, Judas going out and hanging himself. Um, it's verse 5, and I'm just going to read it just for the sake of argument and clarity and so verse 5 says, And throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple, he departed and went and hanged himself. Now, we have the benefit of understanding that we need some context to understand that verse. But for the sake of example, what if my context went like this? Well, what you need to know about Judas is that he was a disciple. And what if I wanted to provide more context and say, and a disciple is someone who was handpicked by Jesus to be taught on a personal level with him for years at a time as they lived together and worked together and moved together and served and, and, and they served in direct ministry under Christ while he was on the earth. I'm providing context, but am I really providing the full context of what's going on when Judas hangs himself? Because if we're not careful, if we just explain who said it, and even if I explain, well, this is in the book of Matthew, written by Matthew, it was an account of Jesus' ministry here on earth, right? So I'm providing context, but we're still not fully understanding, as you and I already understand, the significance behind Judas hanging himself. Because if I'm not careful, I can explain that he's a disciple, I can explain what a disciple is, and we can almost build the context of what he did was instructional for us. Now, what happened is certainly instructional for us, but, but not in the affirmative sense. And so context runs deeper than just knowing who said it or when they said it. There's what we call the entire council of Scripture. There's a broader scope of what we're discussing, and it matters as we read Scripture. If we read verses 1 through 10, which I'm not going to do right now, we would certainly understand more. So just describing Judas and who he was and what his office meant and what book it is, is not full context, just like the verses by themselves may not be full context, but they work together to build a fuller context. But what we realize that we have to do through this example 
is that if we really want to know, and what you and I take for granted, and what we already know about Judas, if we've grown up in church, is we're really applying all the information we know about Judas when we read that text. And then that starts to make sense. Because we know Judas is the one who betrayed the Christ. And so now we start to understand where the silver came from, and we start to understand why he's so distraught, right? Don't take for granted that you are using all the scope of that information when you're reading. And bear in mind that if you're going to understand other portions of Scripture, perhaps it is appropriate to use the same scope of consideration and, and information at your disposal to do so and to understand accordingly. Context is so much deeper than just the verse before and the verse after, as I've already said. Um, it's appropriate, I think, to take a systematic approach to how we understand Scripture so that we won't eisegete as we study. On the survey level of literary analysis, and I cannot stress enough the survey level, because if not, Megan would correct me. I'm sure once you go past the 200-level classes, this is not the case. You must really find what's really there. But certainly on the survey level of literary analysis in college, you can pretty well find what you're looking for when you do essays on, on works, right, on, on, on uh, writings. And essentially, if you're a strong, convincing writer and you can build a moderate defense based on a few quotes from what you've read, um, generally on that level, that's going to be acknowledged as getting close to what they're looking for in literary analysis. In fact, I, as well as others, have gone out with the sole purpose of seeing what we could get away with in terms of pushing the limits of what's reasonably to be found within a text and the undercurrents of that text. Um, and you can kind of get away with that at that level. But that doesn't work when we start reading the Bible. And that's not appropriate when we start reading the Bible. It sounds silly and good-natured, but if we apply that to the Bible, what we're doing is we're studying eisegetically, and there are consequences. A hugely important challenge we face when we read is a phenomenon, a phenomenon known as confirmation bias. In this scenario, confirmation bias is the ease with which we connect dots that would support assumptions that we're walking into as we read a text. Uh, certainly things that we would want the text to say as it would relate to things we want in our lives. And that's not to say that there won't be things in Scripture that we are very glad that they apply to us, and they are good, and they are relevant to our lives. But we, again, need to be careful that we're not finding what we want in the text, but that we are understanding what the text says and shaping our understanding to the text, and never the other way around. That's a lot of setup. We're about to start talking about Joshua, but the question I want to pose this morning, how do we understand Joshua 1, 9? What do we do with it, and how do we understand what it means? Uh, I know I've seen how it's understood by some in the past, um, or perhaps not understood, uh, but I do think that this is, along with a few other passages, one of the more misused, misunderstood passages that we see. And right as we get started, I just want to give you a thought experiment uh, as we open up to this text, uh, just to consider. Um, so suppose with me that a man is currently in an extramarital affair. One day, the other husband comes home early, unexpectedly, and scrambling, the man winds up hiding in the closet. The husband immediately notices the other man's shoes when he gets home, and as a result, he goes and gets his shotgun. Understandably, the adulterer is now very, very worried. In this hypothetical situation, let's pretend that we have one verse that we get to quote to this man. How many of us would say, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Well, why wouldn't we? He's certainly scared. He could use some courage. And the Lord could certainly be with him in that closet right now. But why wouldn't we quote that verse to him? 
I hope what we intrinsically understand is that that is not an appropriate application of this verse. And if we do understand that, then we're starting to scratch at the surface of what we're talking about, that these instructions, even in the Old Testament, as they apply to Israel and then us, have a context and have an appropriate use. Okay. Be turning to Joshua chapter 1, and as you are, I'm going to give you two cheat sheets. I'm going to give you the one that we use in youth, uh, which is not mine, and then I'm going to give you another one that's also not mine. It's Frank Turek's. But as we read scripture, and we're going to think about this today as we go through Joshua, the question that we ask in youth is all, all the time is, what does it say? Let's understand it well, what it's saying, that we're understanding the text as it reads. What does it mean? What is the authorial intent? What is the context and capacity of what we're reading? And what does it mean for me? As we bridge the hermeneutical gap and understand how it applies to us, it is appropriate to first establish what it meant as its own, and then we understand what it means for us. Frank Turek has perhaps a little bit better of a one. He uses the acrostic STOP, S-T-O-P. S stands for situation, and he's asking what is the broader context of what we're reading? What is the situation of the text we're reading? T, he asks the type of literature. Is this a poem? Is this historical record? Is this genealogy? Is this expository? Is this prophecy? Is this law? Is this a sermon? What are we reading? What's the literature? What form of literature is it? What type of literature is it? O is the objective of, excuse me, the object of the passage. Who or what is this passage about? Because if we're going to understand how it applies to us, it would be right to understand who or what it's applying to first and foremost, and then how that applies to us. And then P is the question, is it prescriptive or descriptive? Is it simply an account of something, or is it instructional moving forward into perpetuity? I hear Joshua 1.9 quoted about as much as I hear Isaiah 29.11, and it's not quite as mishandled, but it's close. Um, The question I want to ask is why could Joshua be courageous? Because when we use Joshua 1.9, we're encouraging ourselves to be courageous. And I don't think that's totally inappropriate, but I think that there are some terms to why Joshua was to be strong and courageous and not fearful. And I think as we understand why Joshua was supposed to be strong and courageous and not fearful, we understand why we, in turn, are, not, are to be strong and courageous and not fearful. The first thing I want you to see, um, well, let's read 1 through 9. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I promised to Moses, from the wilderness and and this Lebanon, As far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right, to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that all that is written in it, excuse me, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous, do not be frightened, and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. The first point I want us to look at today is found in verse 2. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I have given them, and to the people of Israel. 
Joshua could be courageous because of his commission. And you know I love alliteration. I was raised Baptist. I've got it everywhere in this uh, lesson. Joshua could be courageous because of his commission. Much like Philippians 4, 13 isn't necessarily about how Jesus helps you kick more home runs from the three-point line in the Super Bowl. This courage Joshua is commanded to have can apply to us, but we don't get to choose how, okay? To be pure to the text is to understand Joshua could be courageous, not only could be, was instructed to be courageous because he was doing what God had assigned for him to do. This, in part, was his confidence. He had, been giving marching, he had been given marching orders, and he was to follow them. And if he was following them, he could be courageous because God, the holy God, had given him a commission of what to do. Joshua could be courageous because his purpose was born of something greater than his desires. And that doesn't mean that any purpose outside of your desires is legitimate. I would humbly submit to you that the only meaningful purpose you could ever find is to understand God's commission for you in your life. I think what we learn from Solomon surely is that everything else is trivial. Joshua was courageous because of his commission. I'm going to move on. Joshua, in verses 3 through 5, Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you just as I promised to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites and the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Joshua could be courageous. The second point I want us to see, Joshua could be courageous because of a covenant with God. We go back through, we've been looking at, as we've moved through Genesis, the Adamic, the Noahic, the Abrahamic, the Mosaic, we understand these covenants as we work through Scripture. Joshua was standing on the promises of God, if you'll humor me with a reference to a hymn. Joshua's courage was not in a vacuum. Joshua could be courageous because he understood that what he was banking on now, I talked to a lot of people uh, working in finance and working in banking that wish we were still on the gold standard. They said that our money doesn't mean anything because it's just an ideal now. It doesn't have any physical representation of value behind it. But when we were on the gold standard, it did. Because for every dollar in the United States, there was a dollar's worth of gold somewhere that that bill represented. Such is not the case anymore. Forget the gold standard. Joshua had the God standard. Joshua understood that his confidence could be born of the fact that he was leaning on and counting on a promise that God had made to Moses, that God had made to their fathers, and God was acknowledging and saying, just as I have promised them, I am promising you this is what I'm going to do. Bible is full of promises from God. It would seem at times we find them lacking because we want to add to them the promise of comfort, cash, and Cadillac. Don't put promises in God's mouth, but also don't undersell promises God has made and understand what he was promising. And to that point, two things you need to really know about these verses God promised Israel this land, and you ain't Israel, and I'm not either. But that doesn't mean that this can't be instructional for us. We see Joshua's courage born of a promise of the holy God. A third point I want us to see, and I know I'm moving quickly. I 
intended to be a little bit short today. I wear y'all out so often, I thought, you know. And I don't want to take more time than what's necessary for a simple lesson in context. In verses 7 and 8, we read, Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. These verses, I almost wish that we would introduce a law that you could not quote Joshua 1.9 if you did not first read these verses with it. When I hear Joshua 1.9, my first thought is, are you reading the verses directly before it? Now, that we would never pass that, because how big would that have to be to hang in your living room, Right? There's not enough room for all that. The text would have to be pretty small. But Emily, hold me to this. If we ever hang Joshua 1, 9 in our house someday, we're going to put these verses with it first. Joshua could be courageous because he meditated on and kept the holy law of God. If you've had the privilege of reading through Joshua, and I do mean that, if you have not read through Joshua, you are missing out. Any chapters, any books you have left that you haven't read, I would strongly encourage. Certainly Joshua is a good one to start with to whet your appetite. I love the book of Joshua. What we see very shortly after this in the book of Joshua, as we follow Israel further through history, when they are obedient, all they need to tear down the city walls of a massive ancient city, all that they need are trumpets and shouting. When they are disobedient, they could outmatch an enemy force in every metric conceivable to man, and they would not find success. They would be turned back by fighting forces, an incremental capacity of their own, when they were disobedient. We don't have to wait long in the book of Joshua to see God make good on what he's saying here to Joshua. Israel would be silly to not have courage if they understood who was on their side. But part of understanding who is on their side, they better understand that the holy God of Israel expects his word to be revered among his people. That's non-negotiable. That's not on the table for a debate. God took his law seriously. Israel was to take his law seriously. We are to take God's law seriously. And you say, now wait a minute. I'm under the new covenant. Jesus did not end the law. He expanded on it. How many times have we talked about this? Jesus said, the law says, do not commit murder. I say that if you hate your brother, you have committed murder in your heart. Jesus said that the law says, thou shalt not commit adultery. Jesus said that if you lust after a woman, you have committed adultery. Jesus brought the full expanse of the law into view. We are to keep God's holy law. You ever get nervous? When you look in your rearview mirror and finally notice a cop is behind you? See, I do. And if I'm going to be honest, which I would hope I would be honest, it's because deep down I know that I have a tendency to speed. See, it's not enough that I know the law 
In fact, knowing the law is how I know so well where I'm not keeping it. But that's just it. I'm not keeping the law. As a counterpoint, I bet Sam Robertson doesn't even have a fledgling of nerve when he sees a cop behind him. In fact, the only thing Sam needs to be scared of is that the cop gets so annoyed going so slow that he pulls him over just so he can go around him. That's Sam's deepest concern in this matter. But Sam is not worried because he knows the law and he's keeping the law. It's a stupid law. It's not God's law, but uh, no, Sam's keeping Sam is keeping the law. Why wasn't it appropriate to use this verse with the adulterer in our earlier example? The adulterer wasn't keeping the law. Why would he be courageous? This brings us to the verse of the hour. Let's read it again. Verse 9 says, Have I not commanded you, Joshua? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you forever you go. How do we understand this verse? It is descriptive in nature as it is a record of a conversation that God had with Joshua. But it is prescriptive in nature, or simply the what it means for me portion of the questions we ask, is that we can draw parallels as we model ourselves after Joshua's obedience to the Lord. In my time of wanting courage, when I'm tempted to reach down into the bag of quotable verses and pull out Joshua 1.9, I find it appropriate to ask myself, can I take courage knowing that I am doing what God has told me and called me to do? Part of knowing this, this requires that you would know what God has for you to do. This works both broadly and specifically. You never have to wonder if you're supposed to share the gospel. You don't have to stay up at night unsure, wrestling with it. You never have to wonder if you're supposed to make disciples. It's not a maybe thing. What you may stay up wondering is if you're meant to make disciples and share the gospel in Iran or Syria. But you never have to wonder if you're supposed to share the gospel. So if we're going to be courageous, we have to ask, can we be courageous because we know that we are doing what God has called us to do? A consequence of this is that there is no courage in safe things if it is not what God has called you to. If you understand this, if I understand this, we should lack courage in the safe things if we're being disobedient to God. Attacking a primitive fighting force of 5,000 with 15,000, who would ask for courage? And those aren't the exact numbers, I'm giving an example. And yet, it was unsafe for Israel. Can I take courage knowing that I am relying on a promise of God? This requires that you know what God promises. Can I take courage in my steps because I know that I am meditating on and keeping God's law? This requires that you know God's law. How 
how could you begin to know these things if you don't know God's word? How could you begin to believe that the omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent creator of the universe, that by the authority of his voice, and do you understand that a voice is sound waves traveling through matter, and yet when there was nothing, God spoke with his voice, instantaneously making that possible in his infinite ability this creator of the universe not only has made himself available to be known to us, his creation, which he has no obligation to do so other than his own compulsion and will. Not only has made himself discoverable to us, but seeks for us to know him. Not only seeks for us to know him, but would love us. Not only love us, but would reveal to us a holy, inspired word, his word, to instruct us and to point us back to him so that we would understand him more. And you tell me you believe these things and you can't be bothered to read it? I don't believe you that you believe those things. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. You want this to be a promise? This is a promise from the Lord to the, his people because his people have him as their God. If the Lord is not your God, consider that. There is the opportunity for a tremendous amount of courage in the Lord as we see in Joshua chapter 1, verse 9. But there's a way by which we understand the nature of this courage, and that comes in the eight verses before it. And those eight verses matter, and understanding it matters. And I've finished early, and I actually have uh, <laughs> in my notes, bonus material, time permitting. So I'm going to point to one other thing. I want us to kind of put the, actually, I'm sorry, before I move on, I want to open that up. If anyone has any questions, comments, concerns, snide remarks, rebuttals, I want to open that up if anyone has anything to say before we move on. Um, I think something that, uh, th I mean, this is such a good challenge, su such a good reminder that we walk around kind of patting ourselves on the back and sometimes we don't look so different from the world um, because a lot of times what the world is saying is just be encouraged no matter what, um, not follow God and delight yourself in him and he'll direct your steps. Um, so I think this is such a good encouragement. I, I also think that, there's also, there's a place for us to remind ourselves that where Joshua was where, with his obedience and where I am with my obedience are not always in the same place. And so sometimes, you know, you, you were talking about um, specifically reading, reading God's word, and I agree that if you're not reading God's word, you don't really believe God spoke to us. I, I really do believe that. But I know people who spend hours a day reading, and I'm not there yet. They're way beyond me as far as how much time they spend studying God's Word. Matter of fact, I think sometimes there are some people out there that would look at my life, my, um, my devotion level, and they'd say, man, you don't, you don't act like you believe God at all. And so there might be others that are uh, maybe even part of the Sunday School group that are look, listening and saying, well, I, man, I, I've never read Joshua. I must not love God at all. And um, that's one of the amazing things about who God is, is that the starting point is not where everyone else is, but where we are and what we need to do. 
you know, the, the woman who gave her two copper coins, it still wasn't much money, but it was all she had, and it was where she was. And so obedience to the Lord begins where we are, not where we see everyone else. Anyway, that, 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 I, I, not saying that obedience isn't important, it is. But God takes us where we're at as we choose to obey. I also think it's it's worth knowing and noting that what it looks like to love the law of God is different. There's, uh, I, I think besides keeping the commandments that we know, there's not a standard I'm aware of in scripture that says to be loving God's word, you must be reading X hours or X passages a day. And when you think on the people who this commandment was given to, right? Um, to, to meditate on it day and night, you've got multiple job categories within Israel, um, including the priesthood. So what it looked like for the soldiers or the farmers or the priests to love God's law as they were commanded in their life uh, and their and their daily working looked different for the different people. Um, you know, we have unity and diversity in, in Christianity. We're not we're called to conform to um, God's desires, not each other's lifestyles, right? So I think it's encouraging when you look at what what have I been commanded? What do I know of scripture? Am I following that? And to not worry as much about what people around you are or aren't doing, because it's easy to get yourself tripped up or legalistic by trying to run after standards you see other people setting if those aren't biblical, you know, I, there are obviously many biblical standards that we need to be running after. But if people are setting standards that are personal, while they may be good, that doesn't necessarily mean they are universally applicable. I just want to give time for anyone else. Okay, bonus material. And this should be a little bit easier going, um, I hope, in this group. And if it's not, we have a lot more conversations to have. Uh, prosperity in a biblical context. Let's talk about it. I don't make a practice of subjecting myself to the heresy of prosperity preaching often. But of what I've heard, I don't hear Joshua 1, 8 very often which is interesting because in my translation, it even has the word prosperous. I'm going to read it for you. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. It's got prosperous and success. And I don't hear this verse often. I was wondering why. My best guess is that they don't like that it's conditional. Man, that would be such an encouraging verse if we didn't have to do that obeying the law part. Anyways, your prosperity is in satisfying the call of God in your life. And we're all called to ministry. You will be prosperous in seeing God's will done. And a mark of maturity in your life is the sufficiency of seeing that as a measure of success. And not only a sufficiency, but it becomes a desire. You strive after God's work for you, not the objectives you have set for yourself. Romans 1.10 uses the exact same word for prosperous, if you want to look at that later. And in other translations, we see the word successful. Obviously, it wouldn't make sense for the writers to say, make your way successful and you will have good success, necessarily. That's a little bit like a hat on a hat. But they've used the word prosperous here. And yes, it can have a material connotation when we look at the definition of the original language, but it's not exclusively material. 
And to call back on the Joshua example, if we're going to pull Old Testament texts out of context that apply to Israel and we're going to apply them to yourselves, stop picking the good ones. If you want to do Jeremiah 29, 11, you also need to remember Jeremiah 44, 11. Don't forget that Deuteronomy 28 is still on the table if we're going to quote the Old Testament about ourselves. Let's be careful not to misappropriate God's word to Israel. And now at the risk of straw manning, I hear the counterpoint. Now, wait a minute. God inspired his word. It doesn't stop applying. He knew that we would read it one day in our context. You're right. But when you tell children stories about when you touched the hot eye of the stove or when you kicked a yellow jacket's nest or when you sat away from your parents that one Sunday night in worship and sat with your friends and talked the whole time, when your dad got home, made his leather belt sing and your back porch sting, You don't tell these stories so that your children will then turn around and try them out. They're instructional, but not explicitly, affirmatively instructional. We are to learn for them. God, in all foreknowledge, used his dealings with Israel. You want to talk about a miracle. (laughs) In all his foreknowledge, he used the dealings with Israel to teach us now. But always understand that he's speaking to Israel. I say all this to say, and I'm going to wrap up. If you use this to teach that because in the Bible, God promised a physical inheritance to Israel, that in turn, it means we are promised that comfort, cash, and Cadillac, as my dad often says. I'm going to fight you on that. And ask Emily, in two weeks, she has learned, pretty stinking hard-headed, I'm going to fight you on it. I care because this matters. There's not a close enough when we're dealing with Scripture. I would even submit that if you're concerned with that confirmation bias that we're talking about, if you're falling victim to confirmation bias and finding in the Bible where we're promised material things, your motivation is askew from the very beginning. As we so often say in youth, this is not about us never has been, and to be candid, it never will be. It moves me to tears to think about that we won't need the sun because God's glory will be our light one day. And that day, it will still be about him, just like it's about him right now. The prosperity that we should chase after, that we should desire in Scripture, is being prosperous in how we chase after what God has given us to do. That as we are obedient, that we would see His will accomplished. This is the prosperous path that I should want. And I say I should want because I'm human and I'm not there, but I want to be there. Success as we see it measured in verse 8 is in accomplishing what God has set before us to accomplish. In my life, that has meant not succeeding in things I thought I wanted. In my life, that has meant walking away from law school. In my life, that has meant having less in some regards than what I thought I was going to have in life. But not from arrogance, but but from brokenness, I lean on God that this is the success I want, not what I thought I wanted, but that he would renew my mind and change my heart, that I would desire the success of being obedient to him and running after him. I long for the day that we don't need the sun anymore because the glory of God is among us. I want to open it up one more time for any comments or concerns or questions. And then we'll pray. And then we'll, sorry, go ahead.
Okay, well, let's pray, and then we'll see y'all here in just a little bit. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Lord, forgive me where I misuse it. Correct me and show me. Give me the humility that when people come and show me that I'm misusing it, that I would take the instruction well. We know in Proverbs that a rebuke goes deeper into a wise man, deeper than a hundred lashes into a fool. I certainly desire to be wise. Lord, I pray that we wouldn't twist your word to make what we would prefer it to be, but that by your word we would be changed. Lord, that we would respect your word enough to care to understand it. Lord, as we continue to see strange times, be our guiding light. Bring us together safely here in a little while and prepare our hearts that we would be worshipful. Lord, that we would put you above all else, and that we would seek to see you glorified among the nations. Let's call these things in your name. Amen.